This photograph here is in West Central Colorado. And I try to, in these talks, focus on uh, the Colorado Plateau. And essentially what I try to focus on is the area drained by the Colorado River. Uh, because there's a lot of similarities in features, there's a lot of similarities in the environment, and there's a lot of challenges that we face. There's a lot of similar uh, plant resources and animal resources. So I try to focus on that particular area, and that's not going to change tonight. And what I'm going to look at is change in diet over the last 13,000 years, uh, as we find from the archaeological record. And so we're going to look at this one site right here that's on the Gunnison River called Eagle Rock. And Eagle Rock is um, is a rock shelter, and I know we can advance this, but it's not advancing. Oh, oh, I know why. Because, I, because since I muted or unmuted us, I have to push. Okay, so this, the site number, that odd number that you see at the top is a trinomial. Five is the state, DT is the county, 813 is the 813th site recorded in this county, and that goes to Smithsonian. And it's Eagle Rock is the name of the shelter. Uh, this site dates from 13,000 years ago to 150 years ago. And what gets me about this whole process is the continuity that we have in what the diet is. Um, that's kind of a surprise to some, in some ways. So if you look at this up, the tri-state area, you have Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado. That's the upper Colorado River drainage system. 79% of all the water that's in Lake Powell, that's directly to the west of us and to the north of us here comes from Colorado. So from the western slope of Colorado, most of the water that's inside of Lake Powell comes. It's the, the principal source of water is in the area that we're at. The Gunnison is one of the major tributaries of uh, the Grand River, which is now called the Colorado. It's called the Grand Canyon because it used to be the Grand River that went through there. And this Grand River system that drains uh, this whole area is really dissected and it's marked by canyons. In some ways we could call these people either desert people or canyon people because of where they selected to live. Both the desert and the canyons had viable plant communities that made it real good for people to live there because you could go after plants year round. Um, this is the Eagle, Eagle Rocks general view. Those are the West Elks to the, that you see in the upper foreground there. And then you see the Gunnison River in the foreground. And on this plateau is an area that's uh, rich in, in, in archaeological resources. Okay, Eagle Rock sits right here. And I don't know if I've got a pointer or not. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. You can Hang on, let me, let me just get the dumb chat box out of there. We go. Okay, okay. so this, this is Eagle Rock right here. And you can see this rock shelter right here. That is where the people lived uh, 13,000 years ago. And now it's not dancing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's okay. No worries. I am just well, I'm about to go away too. But there we go. And it's marked by rock art. And if you know anything about rock art, you've seen rock art probably possibly in your life. But if you look at this, there's stuff that's superimposed on top of the rock art. This is elk or deer that are in this particular location. And then on top of it are other animals like mountain sheep. And there's uh, in, in this case here, there's an ungulate, which we don't know, but this has been written on for some period of time. One woman just said, uh, uh, Carol Patterson said that she thought that it was paleo uh, age rock art, which makes it between 13 and 9,000 years old. And the intriguing thing is, is that what's articulated on this rock art is what was consumed inside of the shelter, deer, mountain sheep, et cetera, like that, were things that were major sources of food. So in the Eagle Rock shelter that we have right here, we excavated about 200 square meters so we have a pretty good idea of what was going on there. And as you can see in this photograph, it's got a nice overhang and it was extremely dry in there. And what that did was led, led to the preservation of plants. These are the features that we found inside of here. And a feature is a thermal space where people take in, in, and modify food, cook food, food, keep things warm. But we call them thermal feature until we actually do the analysis. In all, we recorded 115 thermal features. Actually, two of them are not thermal features. One is a structure and one is something else. There are five types of features. There are sheet, rock line, slab line, deep basin, and shallow basin. Except for slab line, they span all times periods and the slab line pits date between 3,000 and 8,000 years ago. And I'll show you slab line in just a moment. Well, we, we will look at some of the generalizations about the features we covered dating from 6,000 to 13,000 at the first part of the lecture. 
So in the first part of the lecture, I'm going to look at 6,000 to 13,000 years ago and look at the food sources then. And then I'm going to go far forward and go to where they begin to have agriculture in the region. So these features right here, these features right here, thermal features, and this is a slab line feature that dates to 79, uh, 79 to 790 EP. And I'll show you that in a moment. At the bottom is a slab line feature, or a slab line feature. It's not slab line, it's slab. At 12,000 to 1246. And it's interesting what they process with inside those features. We also found a basket that dates to 6,765. And that's the top of the area that we're going to be discussing tonight. So basket was found at 6,000 years ago. And what I'm going to look at is that stuff that was before 6,000 years ago inside the site. This basket is made out of willow. And it's, it's I mean, I, yeah, it's made out of willow. And it's quite interesting. You can see where it sits. And this is intriguing. This soil is brown. There was a, a drought just like what we're experiencing right now throughout the West. And at between about 4,000 and 6,000, there was what they call a midi thermal warming period. And we had a severe drought and there was a lot of buildup of sands. And this place was a, an area that you'd come back to because the river ran right through your front door. So you always had access to water here. So you would always return. Now, at the beginning of this period, the one that I just showed you where the basket was from, we look at these things and you can't maybe see these on your, on your screen at home or wherever you're at. But if you look at here, this is Roos and this is Kinopodium, we know it's Kinoa. And uh, we also have oases and cacti. Cactus, poaceus, roofs, and kinopodiums have been food sources for 13,000 years. And what we primarily focus on in that period of time is the eating of mammoths and large mammals. There were no large mammals found inside of the shelter, though we found over 3,000 elements of, of animals was inside of the shelter that date between 6,000 and 13,000 years ago. So there were 3,000 bone elements found inside of the shelter. None of them were what we would call mega, megafauna. However, we did find extinct fauna inside of these uh, cyst, and I'll talk about that just one moment. This is a slab line pit that dates to 7850, but the slab line pits date from about 8,000 to about 3,000, and then they go out of use. They're no longer used. It's good for thermal retention. You can bake, you can cook, you can use it as an oven. That's possibly why we have so many uh, grass seeds inside of it, is because of the fact that we they're cooking breads inside of this homemade oven. At the top of this, it gives the macro botanical remains in the fill in the feature that included saltbrush seeds, uh, saltbrush embryos, and prickly pear cactus, a prickly pear seed fragments, kinoam seed fragments, sumac seeds, uh, seed fragments, juniper seeds, and fragments of unidentified plant tissue. I'll come back to this in a moment. We found that same thing at 12,000 years ago. Almost that identical uh, sweep of, of plant material we found at 12,000 years ago. And those are pretty intriguing. Of the five uh, radio five X radiocarbon assays we currently have from the site, uh, the, the five X ratio radio that means the ratio that we've got seventeen date to the paleo period. So we have a high degree of reliability in these that we have right here. We have a, a high degree of reliability in saying what we're going to say about the plants. It comes from seventeen features. This right here is a curve that basically shows where the main time periods are, and you can't see it on this. It's been propped off. But the main occupations occurred between seven and 9,000 years ago, with some occurring at about 13,000, so 13,000, uh, 13,000, uh, 11,000, and 9,000 years ago. You have heavy duty occupation in the inside the sites. So these right here are the conventional ages. I'm just showing you just to prove the science. These are the dates that we have. So we have everything from 10, uh, 1090, 12,925, 1295, all the way up to 9,000. And that'll be, I'll give you more dates in just a moment. This is what the stratigraphy looks like. What's intriguing is, is that this, this part of the cave was filled in. I don't know if you can see my hand up there, but this part of the cave was filled in with gravels. That part where you see all of that disturbance was filled in by sand. It made it very easy to dig into, made it very easy for you to go and put your feature in or to, to dig your fire pit. You could scoop it out with your hand then you could lay in the wood and then you could cook. The problem of it is it's so easy to dig in but sometimes you would dig your feature into somebody else's feature that's 2,000 years older than yours. That creates a challenge. So we spent a great deal of time excavating it. And the entire area that you see right here was excavated with a broom or with a trowel. So we have a high degree of reliability in knowing what we're finding inside of this. We found this bifurcated point that dates to 8,500 years ago. Bifurcated means it has two years on it. It was 
covered with a piece of leather. It was hafted to a spear. We know that they did go after several animals, which I'll talk about in a second. This is a picture of that, that bifurcated point with a wrapping around it that was attached to a spear point. And these are bifurcated points that we found in that excavated area that you saw. These points date from uh, about 5,000 years ago to the 9,000 years ago. Bifurcated means double-eared, and it was used. And if you, uh, it was used for funny. But the intriguing thing, and I need to go back, the intriguing thing about this is, has something to do with the animals that they were going after. If you notice, these are scalloped. And they're barbed. And it's partially because they're at the river, and we know for a fact that they're going after fish. So in the Gunnison River, the inhabitants at this site were going after fish. We now have those fish bones in for genetic analysis, but we think that they're minnows, the big, long six-foot chubs that they have in the upper part of the Colorado River, but we do not know that empirically. We're assuming that based on the nature of the spinal material, but we need to get the genetic material back before we can make empirical statements about it. But the other animals, we'll go to the next slide first, the other animals that they were going after, the date towards where the stem points are, the animals that they're going after here are fairly unique. The number one animal killed at this particular site was rabbit. And that was all the way back to 13,000. So we're gonna stay at 13,000 for a minute. They were killing rabbits. They were killing pygmy rabbits. They were killing sage grouse. They were killing mountain sheep and they were killing deer. That continuum of killing deer can, uh, goes all the way up to the present uh, at the site 150 years ago. So the deer that were illustrated in the rock art were something that they were procuring at the site. And one person, one archeologist said, what this basically is, is a billboard that says, stop here and you can kill deer. Because the deer would come down right to the river, down Lawhead Gulch beside it. They would get water and go back up to the hill. You just had to wait for them to pass by. So you were sitting in an optimal place for getting meat resources, but they not only got meat resources, they got prickly pear cactus. A practically pair of cactus that these people were processing or making these things are pretty intriguing to me. Anytime you got prickly pear cactus, it can't run away. So what they did in this particular site, and they do it all over the all over the Western United States, is take the prickly pear and throw it in a fire. The fire burns off the spines. So if you find prickly pear uh, places where they're processing, it's flat. It's not scooped out. It's a flat sheet. And inside there, you find the prickly pear cactus that they're taking and processing, and they're eating the interior of it. They scrape off the spines, they get out the interior of it, they make it into a guacamole, they mix it with the other foods and vegetables. But they've got vitamin A and they've got vitamin C. I'm pretty sure that, that A is one of the vitamins of the principal there. That, that point that you see right there was found in place. And you see these narrow sheets right here. It's right above two processing areas for, for cactus, uh, for prickly pear cactus. They weren't very large, but the prickly pear cactus areas are isolated. Why that is, is because you don't want to sleep where you got prickly cactus cares, uh, prickly, uh, prickly pear cactus spines. <laughs> you want to make sure that your bed is a little bit softer than that. And you don't want to roll over and get these spines inside of, inside of you as you're sleeping. The features dating from 10,000 to 13,000 uh, BP are two types, shallow basin and the sheet. Uh, there's going to be an exception to that in a moment. It's not quite shallow. What is interesting is in this time period, the dates, the features have charred plant materials in them that suggest extensive knowledge of edible plants. And what happens is when they start having agriculture, they begin to plant these same plants with their corn. So they plant these plants in conjunction with corn, especially kinopodium, especially sunflowers. They put them in the same field with the corn. Now this right here is this right here is where we have this profile putting this here, that's what it looks like. Martin is standing right there and he's mapping this. But that is the depth of it. He's down two meters. So it's two meters down to the bottom of the side where they're processing that quick repair early on. You can see the monos, you can see feature 89, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment, feature 89 and 87 and 86, actually it's 87 that I'm going to talk about. We took a pollen column from this and what this does is it shows changes in the soils. And I'm going to go briefly through this and explain the soil changes. This right here is nothing but windborne deposits. This deposit right here has more water in it, so it means it was wetter period of time. This is that one that I was describing. The basket laid right here at this interface 6,000 years ago, and the bottom of this ended about 70. So you had 1,000 years almost of desiccation at this location. You had 1,000 years where you have a lot of uh, windborne sediments coming in. You still have the river, you still have good resources beside you, but you have a thousand years of what we would call desiccation 
or soils turning looser, more, more erosion. Then below that, it's wetter. So we know for a fact that from about, we know for a fact that from about, let's go back to this. We know for a fact that from about 13,000 years ago to 6,000 years ago, or about 6,000 years ago, it was wetter. So you had more plants and you had more variability, but it was still a desert. When we talk about it being wetter in a desert, we mean that instead of eight inches of moisture, we have nine. So just keep that, <laughs> just kind of keep that in mind. It's not I'm necessary. I'm glad you mentioned the climate deadly because um, Nat had put in the chat, maybe you can read it now, yeah. his question. Yeah, he was, well, and I love it because I know Nat had the log off. He said it's high and he's really happy that you were able to join us. Um, he was saying, I wonder what the climate was like if a site occupancy would depend on a local climate, 10,000 years of climate can change a lot in right. regards to living conditions. So, so to, 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 to answer his question, though, he's not on, I'll, I'll go through this. So if you look at that, if you look at this right here from here, at the bottom, this, this bedrock is why it's unexcavated. From bedrock to this point right here, it's wetter. So you would have had more, you'd had more plants, but not different. So you have yucca, you have kenopodium, which I didn't mention the yucca enough, but you have yucca and kenopodium in higher quantities. There wouldn't be a change in vegetation here. Up on the hillsides, there was a change. So up on the hillsides, you had more ponderosas or more desert, yeah, more ponderosas. How, however, this area here is wetter. This particular point right here is drier. You still depend on the same plant resources, the same animal resources. This area here is wetter. And this would be uh, that period of time between about 3000, 3000 a AD and about, or you know, 3000 AD, 3000 BP and uh, uh, 1200 years ago. This particular weather period that you have right here, this drier period here is a mix. It's not easy to define it, but it's a little bit drier. So we do have a change in the environment. Okay. This person is excavating out feature 87, and this kind of bespeaks the whole issue. This projectile point came from inside that feature. That's a paleo point. It, it's it's stem, it's a paleo point. And inside of this, they have cactus, goosefoot, and uh, sagebrush, sumac, and willow family greasewood. Up here, you see the animals, jackrabbit, uh, deer, mouse, squirrel, the mouse is intrusive probably, squirrel, uh, and then a coyote, and we'll talk about coyote in a, in a moment, and a deer-sized animal, okay? Meaning they're still processing these particular animals. In feature 49, we have the same thing, and I'm just giving these dates because that's 11,000. The continuity in the plants is quite incredible. So when you see Martin excavating here to the top of this, you've got this continuity taking place. Top of feature 115, it's drier. And then feature 114 and 7, it's the same in rootfall. Now I'm going to go through this a little bit faster, not too fast. This right here is again 11,000 year old feature. You see the same thigh thing, you see cacti, you see poaces, you see rootlets, and you see roots. And then you find small bones from being cooked. Again, this is uh, 11 to 12, you get cactus, you get optima, which is the same thing, and you get roost, and this is real important, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And here you have this uh, 13,000 year old feature, and they're processing cactus, they're processing uh, prickly pear, they're processing grouse, you see the grouse bone, bone, bone is burned, they're processing rabbit, and you see that they're in small elements there, there's, they're processing mountain martin, uh, the Martin, I think, is spelled correct there. But Mountain Martin is American sable, so they're at eating uh, sables and they're eating mountain sheep. And the intriguing thing is, same thing with this feature here that you've got that dates to 13,000, they're processing the same thing through times. Now, this is roost, and roost is something that is one of the few things that they process consistently. And it was processed 12,000 years ago, but the roost is made into a berry. And I'm going to read to you this. Quick question from the comment. Um, what is a sable? A sable? Yeah. A sable is like a mink. So a, a sable is like a mink. And so you oh, can okay. use it for making furs, but you can also cook the animal too. Perfect. So it's, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a sable is a fur. Okay. So Annie Prue writes, roost families are some of my favorite small trees. When the cottage is done and we put in new gardens, Staghorn sumac will have a prominent place. My mother's family is used to make a kind of lemonade from the staghorn berries by soaking them in water overnight, adding sugar and God knows what else. Roos is a benign part of poison ivy group. Birds adore the seeds. Think about it. You buy a river, you've got roos, you can make lemonade, you can process it right, right here at the site. So who was this person? 
Uh, Annie Crew. Oh, I'm sorry, Annie Crew. She wrote a, a book on the Red Desert, and she wrote uh, Shipping News. She wrote. She's a. She's a. She's an author uh, of some note. And she wrote this about what her family had done. I asked her if she'd ever seen Ruth processed when she was growing up, and she said yes, she had. Now, okay. have you have you ever tried the sumac? Yeah, yes, have you? No, but I I grew up where it was uh, everywhere. Yeah, it's it's really pretty tasty. You can do it two different ways. Just eat it raw. But I think that these guys cooked it all. I don't know why they cooked it so much. But they didn't cook it all. They made we know they made the lemonade too. Yeah. So they made the lemonade. Uh -huh. Now, where you see that yellow line right there is 19, 19, 1940. Um, if, if you look at that line and you see that line right there, that line signifies a major change at the site, and that's the introduction of corn. There's a woman out of the University of Arizona that wrote her one of her treatises on the fact that when corn came in, they didn't abandon those wild plants that they've been using for 13,000 years. They added it to what they were farming. So what happens, however, is corn becomes something that produces a high amount of extra volume and you've got to store it. You've got to store your corn so you can grow it the next year and you have to make it so that it's there for use. That changes what happens in the upper Colorado Basin. You begin to see massive architecture beginning to appear in the upper Colorado Basin. Most of us are most familiar with it from Cedar Mesa, from down at Wapaki, from other places, Chaco, Mesa Verde. You see it there, but in real isolated areas, they are storing corn and we are finding granaries all over the place where they were storing corn. The question is why, why? And I'm going to try to answer that a little bit. In a site that we excavated called Cook, which is in the upper part of the Colorado River Basin system, we came across this cooker. This is bedrock that, that Laura is sweeping right there. And you see that cooker and it dates to 1140. Inside that cooker, they're mixing corn and they're mixing those grasses that I just described along with meats. They're making cornbread, they're making tortillas, they're making whatever they're making at this particular location, but they're mixing it and they're commingling it. With corn, you begin to store it. Uh, the feature 14, you have chenopodium, you have ZMAs, I'm not gonna read this to you, but you have chenopodium, you have ZMAs, and you have this, the same similarities with inside this feature that dates to 1100 as what you're finding in those lower features at 13,000 with the addition of maize. You have to have a way to store maize through the year. And just, I'm gonna ask, there's not very many people here, but what do you think is a principal thing that's gonna to happen to your corn when you put it up? What's two things, three bad things that can happen to Animals corn? are gonna eat it. Yes, number one. Animals are gonna eat it. Number, what else is gonna to happen to it? I think they would draw moisture. Yeah, draw moisture and then it'll mold. Right. Yeah. yeah, right. So you've got to seal these, you've got to seal these things. And why they are still standing to this day and why we still find them is because they used organic materials to build. So they used local adobe, they used willow, and they used locally available plant material to, to build them. And they did something else that I'll talk about. Uh, well, I'll, I'll use this to talk about it. They seared their wood. So when they were building it, they would take and run the wood through charcoal. And then they would run this through charcoal and then they would use that so that it had been seared that nothing would gnaw through it. The other thing, it kept away a lot of in insects and they would drop charcoal inside of the greener. So the charcoal provided a smell thing that was not so good for the rodents and the rodents would keep out of it. It wasn't a poison, it was pretty organic and it would keep the animals out. But the beauty of these things is, is they were built for some time. Yes. Uh, chat question. Um, so Colleen uh, wants to know, uh, thinking back at the rock line oven, would those have been used to cook rabbit, sheep, et cetera? over a fire or mainly to bake types of bread? Both, both. Um, and in some ways, what they did was they baked that stuff together. So they baked it, they baked it, they, they baked it all together. And that clay line pit that you just saw would be a similar thing to what they did with the rock line. But the rock line would really heat back. So the one thing about those rock line features is they were good for cooking tubers too. And I didn't bring up tubers because that's not something we had here, but if you had biscuit root or if you had uh, potato, you would also cook those. And we have found potato in excavations, but that would be another thing you could cook. It was more like an oven. And the same thing with that clay line thing, but they did more big, yes. And I do have one other question. Um, so first of all, I want to make sure that I clarify this properly. Can one corn introduced? If this side, at this site now in, in southern Arizona, it's between two and three thousand years ago. Okay, so I okay, so I got that vague 
complete wrong, Julie. And um, the second, the other part was, where did the corn come from? It mm -hmm. came from down here and it came north. And by, now it couldn't have made it earlier, but by roughly 2000 years ago, we had corn in the northern part of the basin. So it was fast. It was, it was, and the reason I think it moved so fast is you could just add it to whatever you were planting or whatever, whatever else you're processing, and you could put that in there. These particular pins are the areas that we looked at this year. Those pins are the ones we've looked in 2020, a uh, little bit of 2020, but mainly 2021. These are the areas that we've looked at for these granaries where we've looked at where we've got these bones and, and, done, and, and done work. So these are the, these are these points here, DPS points of where we look for these granaries. The ones in yellow in Wyoming are the one that kind of gives some additional fascination to this whole process. The granaries that we look at are in Browns Park, right by the Utah border, Echo Park, Utah, uh, y, uh, Utah, Colorado, and Douglas Creek directly in extreme northwestern Colorado. Um, and what we found in there is some pretty intriguing things. So Browns Park, Skull Creek, Douglas Creek, and Shape Tail Basin is the primary focus. But we found out that people had been recording granaries in this area back to the early part of the 1900s. Goggins recorded this particular granary that's got these lattices over the top. If, and I'm going to explain it. You see how that he's got this cutaway where he shows wood beams going across and then he's got plaster on top of it. And what we found is that we found these kind of things in real life. So this is a blow up of that particular picture from a 1948 publication. And you can see how that they put this on top of it, which is absolutely fascinating. If I'm going the wrong way. Okay, this is a cap, and this one dates to 870 BP. But what they did was a cap that crossed and they put wood through this. And when they put the wood on it, then they put a flat piece on it and they put a hole in the center and they capped it with the top piece. They had to seal in the corn. Okay, they put the, in, in the cases of the ones that we were looking at that were similar, they took and they put it on a foundation, sandstone foundation here. And then they built it upwards. And I don't know if you can see my hands, but they built it up so that the foundation was actually narrower than the top because they wanted to build it in a curvaceous form. They wanted to curve the process. So in this site on Douglas Creek, where you have this complete ones, that are the complete granaries like this, they were like this with thin walls at the bottom and they curved up. And so the architecture is quite, quite simple, but they're putting it in places where you can't see them. And they're putting them in places that are out of the way, in places that are dry, and they last to this day because of the fact that they're in these dry areas. In, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in preserving these particular, uh, preserving the corn, they preserve the structure. So this structure is complete, and it dates to 990 BP, 990 years before present. And inside it was corn, and we date on corn. This one, you have to get down on the ground and crawl into it, and then get your, 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 your corn out of it. And why I'm showing you this is I'm going to show you additional ones from this particular area where they're saving corn and they're storing corn for a very peculiar in reason. Now, the people who live here are called the Fremont. Uh, they're formative. They're transitioning from just gathering to being farmers. We don't know if they moved from down here and moved up, but they're called the Fremont. This is completely latticed with willow and it's covered with mud. But there's two interesting things that are inside this one. And one of them, occurs right here, you can see a patch hole from where a rodent went inside of there and they patched the hole and there's another one up here on top. Mm -hmm. So they patched the hole from where the rodents went in. You can see that they used organic material to make the bindings. They tied it together with organic material. This is willow. These are probably willow branches through here. And then this opening right here was, was placed around. This is a complete greenery. This dates to wow. 700 BP. It's, it, it, and you have to crawl into it. This one here is the same kind of situation. It's put into an area where you can get the corn from. That dates to 870. So you see that corn is spread from down south to this far north to the Wyoming border pretty quickly. Um, I hope this isn't upside down. Does it look upside down to you? No, it's just one of the smaller granary styles that we've got. Let me see if I get the video. Yeah, this is, this is that one. So you see where they've got these walls in between these cracks right here. Now they're storing this corn here for a very important reason, and I'll talk about that in a second. But you can see the amount of corn cobs that are still inside of it. It's 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 filled with corns, and then they would do multiple ones. Winger is an archaeologist. They do multiple ones, and they put them side by side, and and it was just a good way to do it. This is in Lizard Canyon. Um, I'm just showing you different settings that these are in right now. Uh, this is a Winger granary. You can see what it 
looks like it's in Lizard Canyon, and I'm just showing you it's different. Now, this is the one that actually became the tripwire for us to understand it. This is what 5RB705 looked like in 1977. It was struck by the back wall and collapsed. So the Bureau of Land Management paid us to come in and excavate this and reconstruct it. And so we went in and excavated and reconstructed this granary and restored it to its original form. In the process of this, we found over 300 corn cobs inside of it. And right adjacent to it, this is what it looked like when we first profiled it when we, before we reconstructed. And right beside it were these, uh, were these cookers for cooking the corn. This has got corn in the adobe for the top of the roof. Remember where I showed you it was beveled? And then this has put corn on top of that lattice heap. Why do you think they use corn for the top of that? Because they had it. They had it, yes, it's locally <laughs> available. You, you carry the heaviest thing the least farthest. That's the, <laughs> the number one thing is you don't want to carry it far. Why do you think that they use corn for the top of this? Why do you think that they use corn to lace this? It serves as a rebar. So that what you, I'll give you what it is as a rebar. It's light, it adds no more weight on the top of that so that you can use it, but you can climb on top of this. So it's extremely durable, but it binds together the mud so you can create that nice little cap across it. They did it with grass and they did it with other organic materials that was readily available. Uh, these imprints you see here from the stick, you can see the corner printed in the side, but they use this as kind of to hold it together. Uh, you see that it's got sandstone in this and twig, we heated it up to see what it was there. And then we did pollen analysis. And what we found is something really cool. So if you've been to any of these sites on Cedar Mesa or you've been to Mesa Verde, you see that all of this mud is inside of there. And if you look around, there's no mud. Mm -hmm. So they have to mix the adobe with water. And we had to rebuild this and we had to carry the water a mile. And we had to carry the adobe. And what we came to the conclusion was there was a lot of coils in this. What we think they did was they made the mud inside the bottom of the drainages mixed it together and then put it in coils and carried it to the site. The twigs that you see there are from willows or in the pollen we see in there are from waterborne sediments. So they're getting their water, coiling it up and carrying it to the site and then using it for making the mortar that's at these sites. No, no, when you say coiling it, what, what do you mean by that? Um, they, they run it into like these big round coils about this big around mm -hmm. and they put it coiled and they carry it. We got the hypothetical of how they carried it. They carry that coil to the site and then they take and they pull it apart and they pinch it into the holes. And one thing you can see is a lot of their fingerprints inside of these. Mm -hmm. um, so the sticks recovered from the daub were identified as willow, we had it analyzed, and indicate that a member of the widow family was collected in a repair environment. But you can see now this has the coils. So you can see the coils here and you can see them pinching together. Now we've got these cracks here over time because it dries out, but you can see the fingerprints from where they're pinching the coils together to bring this up for the storage process. So how long was the, were the coils? Um, hypothetically, I'm, I'll give you a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. Some of them I think were a meter to maybe a meter 20 mm -hmm. long. They were about this big around, uh, maybe about uh, six five, inches, yeah, five, 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 six five, inches. Five. And then they carried them like this and they carried it to the granary. So they carried it uphill because these are really remote areas. The other problem that they've got is addition to predators is you want people will steal your corn. So you don't want it in a place where it's readily available or ready where anybody can come and just get your corn because then you've wasted a lot of effort putting that together. So we think they carried on their heads or on their backs. We just hypothesized this as to how they get there. But we do know they carried the coils because we do know where the pollen came from. Pollen doesn't travel that far in the air. Specifically, corn pollen only travels 600 feet and willow pollen would travel just about the same distance, travels a little bit further but you're getting this from the river courses to make this material. So this is a coiled joint on the daub. What we did was we heated this up in a furnace, got to the point where we could see where the cracks were. And, and you can see some of them with your naked eye, but once you analyze it under a microscope and once you heat it up like this, you can get your cracks to occur. Uh, heating it causes the cracks to be taking place. This is after we, re this is when we reconstructed the, the granary 5RB705. So we drew it up like this and got it to this point and then we put it across. Now, where was this one? Uh, this is in Northwest Colorado okay. on Douglas Creek. Uh, oh, this is Douglas Creek. Yeah, Douglas Creek. And what I told the students that helped do this. And but, why, why did you guys re redo the site? Yeah, I remember the one that was crushed, the, the rock wall had fallen in and crushed it. And it was in place in 77. So the BLM wanted it to go back. And they couldn't get anybody that would do it for the money that they had. 
so we bid it, we, we bid it and we got it because we went to bid it. But I told the students that if this had lasted from 960 to 1977, that this one that they built had to do the same thing. <laughs> so what was the point of rebuilding it? There's so many of these. Uh, this one here is because of the fact that they wanted to have one that people could go to and not okay. worry about losing the artifact. So you excavated the entire area, which you don't do. You try to leave stuff for future generations. Excavate the entire area because it crushed, do the analysis of it, do the report on it, and rebuild it so that people can come back and see what they look like. For the so general the, public. For the general public. Oh, so yeah. this is so the general public can see and taste and touch it if you want to put it that way. Uh, but the hole is only 20 centimeters across. So look, this is right beside it. So that thing that I showed you a minute ago inside of Cook is actually beside this granary. And inside of this, we found burned corn. Now, they're cooking here, but they're also doing something else. Remember I told you they seared the, they seared the uh, uh, wood? They could sear the corn cobs in this feature and put it in there, and it doesn't affect the taste of the corn. It's partially roasted. It's, 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 a, it's not like paraboiling, mean, it's parapoaching. So they poached the corn in this particular case, and I don't know if they did it very far away, but it was contemporaneous with that site. Now, these are, these are granaries right here. These are granaries right here that you can see, and they're in very secluded places, and I'm gonna skip through this for the purpose of time because there's something important. This is one we recorded this summer, and this is one that was recorded the previous summer uh, with the granary. Now, what's increasingly intriguing is these small granaries and where they're located. This is the Colorado, uh, I mean, the Wyoming Utah border right here. And these granaries are located right inside of Wyoming, right inside of Utah. And the corn cobs that are inside of there are, are just like they were everywhere else, but they're between rocks and they've got a roof on the top of them. A friend of mine did this study, Robert Nash, did an analysis of this. And what his research question, what is the role of maize in the low level food production economy of Fremont? He calls it low level production because he doesn't think that it's labor intensive. In the terms of nomads, nomads only had to work four days to provide their needs, where we have to work five to six days a week to provide our needs. Nomads only had to work four days. These early agriculturalists, they didn't want to give up their free time. I hate to put it this way. They didn't want to give up their free time right, to, to graze corn. Once you graze corn, you're tethered to your crop. You have to make sure the rabbits and the deer don't eat it, but it's not bad if rabbits and deer come eat your corn because you can shoot them while they're doing this and you can get higher kilocalories, number of calories by killing that deer. So you're not really losing that much. So <laughs> the, what is the role in this low level economy? And he comes up with an interesting argument. Maize was used for tactical purposes in order to maintain foraging efficiency and sustain hunter gatherers economy that they focus more on their hunting than they did on their growing. And what he does is he plots where he has these sites and the ones that are in green, are brownstone and ceramics. The ones that are in red are limbics. They're just, they're, they're, they're like projectile points. And the ones that are uh, uh, gold stars are storage facilities. And I'll show you that again. The maize storage in the uplands allowed protracted presence in the uplands and logistical groups could travel further and stay longer than what they could otherwise and provide greater access to larger game. So he broke down how many calories was in corn in a bush of corn and how many calories were there if you killed a deer. And I'm going to put it in other terms. In this case right here, you see where the storage facilities are. What he found in his sites was he found deer and he found mountain sheep like what we found at Eagle Rock, that continuity there. But what's really intriguing is these people are also have access to buffalo. And buffalo we're finding in the Fremont sites. Uh, two basket loads of maize could sustain a group of five individuals for 14 days and would have allowed men prolonged access to large game likely supplemented by women's foraging and small game hunting that was occurring at the same time. What they found and what he concluded is that the upland maize storage, those, those granaries that I'm showing you, the upland grain uh, storage used as a tactical method to maintain efficiency. Maize storage allowed for protracted presence in the uplands to access large game and two basketfuls of maize would sustain five people for 14 days. Just one extra load of mountain sheep provides an additional 29,000 calories or 12 extra person days of food. So by being able to stay up there longer and for getting more mountain sheep, they're bringing home more calories. In terms of bison, and the bison are just out in the plains there, in terms of bison, one bison 
will sustain your family for the whole year if you're mixing it with your vegetables. You don't just eat meat, you mix it with your vegetables and you begin to use the system where you cut the meat into small portions or whatever portions you want to, but you begin to have more calories that can sustain you through the years. It increases your possibilities of survival. Okay, so I have a question oh, for you. Yes, go ahead. Oh, um, so the question was uh, from Kimberly. She wants to know, um, from your experiences on the Asian continent, what similarities and differences have you seen among granaries uh, between here and over there? Uh, well, like, for example, the people I have the most familiarity with would be Mongolians. And they, they're, they'll they use plants, too. Uh, they don't necessarily grow, but they harvest the locally available plants. So in the case of a sheep, let's take a sheep and make it like a mountain sheep. A, a sheep would have a few less pounds than it would a mountain sheep. But from the point that they kill it to the point that it's cut up and ready to go is 34 minutes. So that's how fast they get the cape off and get everything in. They pull the intestines out. Now, the intestines contain partially digested plant life in it. And determining what happens next is kind of intriguing, but they'll pull out the intestinal material and then they'll stuff it back in with meat and they'll stuff it in with herbs and they'll stuff it in with plant material and, and, and additional ground meat and immediately make sausage right at the same place. So I see something very similar that's occurring. So you could mix this corn in a storage facility, maybe not make sausage like the Mongolians do, but something similar is occurring. They're maybe using, we do know that they use the intestines for storage facilities and they use it actual food. I mean, intestines uh, are good for food. Okay, so examples of meat and bone process. Oh, yeah. What I was gonna ask before was, what's meant by protracted presence? Uh, Long-term presence. So like, for example, in most cases, if you didn't have uh, other food to add to your meals, you might be able to only hunt for three days or four days. There's a point where the efficiency of hunting becomes minimized if you can't get an animal. If you have more corn with you, you can maybe find where the deer trip, where the deer, where the deer trails are or where the sheep trails are. But most importantly, you find out where they're going to. You, you can map them. Deer have to drink. Large animals have to drink. Find where they're drinking, procure them there. It becomes even more sophisticated here, cook. Okay, and I'm, I'll use this as an example. At Cook, you have access to three major resources, pinion nuts, oak nuts, oak, you know, acorns, acorns, and you have access to cornfields down below. When the deer go up to eat acorns, you follow the deer into the acorns and you stay there and you harvest acorns and you harvest deer. So you can stay up there longer and bring back more calories. And the more that you bring back, the better it is for the winter time. Now, some winters are nasty. They'll begin right about now and they won't until May. So if you don't watch what you're doing and if you don't take in enough food resources for that protracted period of time, then you're, not, you're gonna have trouble. Beauty of Eagle Rock and why I think it was inhabited so long is you never really have it sock in like that. You don't have the deep snow so that animals always come down there to get forage. So, but in this case, you're going up to a high elevation. This animal right here is bison. And this is a bison at Cook. So the Cook shelter is one of those, the shelter where I showed you where you had that nice lined hearth and it was in bedrock and they were cooking the maize. That's cook shelter, okay? They killed two bison here. These we think they killed down low from, but they killed two different bison. Those, one is from a, we think from a female and one is from a male. Even though they look different in size, it's because of the exaggeration you get on the slide. One is different, one is less robust. We think one's a female, uh, is a cow and the other one's a bull. So they got two buffalo there. Those two buffalo were enough to sustain their food needs for the rest of the year, but that's not what they did. They hunted everything that came along. These are carpals. These are the carpals that they're also processing at this particular site. So they're processing the meat at this location uh, and mixing it with the plant material, the corn. And then they're processing bones. And I have to throw this in. This is for free because we just found this out. We spend all this time, we started excavating Cook 20 years ago. We spend all this time looking at the bone and we knew we had bison and we knew we had wolf. And this is an aside for the wolf. So I'm taking it down the choo-choo track for a second. They would take little bitty baby wolves and get them as, as, as pups and pull out their canine teeth when they started getting it. They would lead the wolf inside of this rock shelter because the fact that it's the wolf is top of the food chain. If a grizzly bear or a mountain lion comes near that in a wolf house, they'll go away. They're afraid of the wolf because wolves, uh, that the top food chain, they're excellent, they're superior predators. This bone is coyote. And what is interesting about this is you can't, you can, you can barely see it, but you can see it a little bit. This is cut mm -hmm. and it's snapped. They're making coyote beads. 
at this particular site. And we had looked at this, but we, we hired an expert. We've got a person out of Washington, uh, Central Washington University that's doing the analysis right now. She looked at this and immediately showed this. And of course it's easy to prove. There's a finished bead that she found in the assemblage. Now we gave her all of the bone and she found this in the assemblage, we missed it. We dug it out and missed it. Uh, uh, but then in addition to that, she found, and we found this at Eagle Rock through bird bones. Now bird bones are excellent for making beads because they're hollow through the center and you take and ring them and snap them. This one, you can see the cut marks on it. You can see the cut marks on this for where they did the first darts on it, but this right here, they're prepping, and then they'll keep taking this for snapping. So we found the bird bones that are right there. These are the beads that we found at Cook. Now, what's really interesting is until Megan Paltrow was the person that did the final analysis, and so she did this, we didn't realize that G, which you see in this particular picture, that G was actually coyote. That there was perforated coyote, that this was a coyote bead that had been made. And, and we definitely did not know until we did this analysis just recently that it was there. Mm -hmm. But the point being is that hunting gains you a lot of items. It gains you tools, it gains you resources, it gives you the ability to make tools. And this is from Cook to make tools for puncture, for, for punctation, and even for knives. Now, this, this is for punctation, for like making buttonholes. This knife right here is absolutely fascinating. It has human antiserum on it. Meaning hmm. either the person cut themselves when they were using it, or it was used to kill a person or for some other thing, but it's got human antiserum mm -hmm. on it. Okay. So oh, yeah. on the topic of, of wild, large animals, um, in what ways do they preserve the meat to eat later? Oh, so that's a good question. Uh, two primary ways is drying, and in some cases they access the salt, salt. If another site that we excavated, which is 21 miles from that granary that we restored, it's literally 21 miles from there. At that particular site right there, they had Epsom salt. And I don't know that I'd want Epsom salt in my food, but because of the fact that it was pure Epsom salt, in fact, you can take it out of our site that's there and sell it on the market. You could, the FDA would pass it. It's that, it's that pure wow. Epsom salt. So that Epsom salt, you lay it there. You don't cover, you don't cover your, your, your meat with Epsom salt. But the Epsom salt is such a good wicking away process. It's such a good drying agent that you lay it down and it literally is like having a dryer. So chemical drying, chemical drying with salt. And in one case, I think Epsom salt. And drying the meat is, is the two primary ways that they do. The other thing you do is you sear it. To make a, a jerky kind of, you don't burn it, but you make a jerky with it. You mix it with pemmican. That's real important in the up, upper uh, Midwest, uh, up in Canada where they made pemmican, they would kill buffalo and they would pound it. And the Matee were real famous for mixing berries and they would sell it all around. I mean, it was traded everywhere. You could take pouches of buffalo, uh, buffalo uh, pemmican and trade it with the berries and other things that were mixed with it. It was high value. Have you ever eaten any dog? Have have I, ever eaten any? any dog? Pemmican. No. Pemmican. I, I have had the jerky for me. It's, it, and yes, I have eaten the dog too, not because I wanted to, because I didn't know that's what I was eating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, mixed with berries, the meat mixed with yes. berries? Yes, but it's not the same kind. I don't think it's the same kind they had, but, but yeah, I have. And it's really good. It is. Yeah, it's it's like trail mix, except it's got meat in it. You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. It's like, take, like your check mix or whatever. <laughs> so so I, a lot of people are involved with this. And most of this stuff we're just learning and some of the problems that we get disjointed when you in science, things change. So what I'm telling you now, next year when I come back, will be a little bit different. I won't reiterate the same stuff. I'll add it fresh and, and reassemble it. But we learn more about things like the fish. The fish are fascinating because we did not know that paleo people were fish, but sure, yeah, they're fishy. They came across the Siberian Peninsula there. They were by water the whole time. And nobody's going to turn down any kind of protein that's available. It's, mm -hmm. just, it's just human nature. I mean, it's good. It's good. Any questions from the chat? Nothing at the moment. Okay. Do you have any questions? No, I, I have some I'd like to share. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'd uh, like to hear. I uh, worked out on the res. I'm not sure if they can hear you um, from far away. Okay. Uh, I worked out on the res for several years. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, after a while, hiking around, I started finding granaries. Uh -huh. This particular site was shown to me, uh -huh. uh, but uh, we're pretty sure they're granaries. 
uh, because there was a, a core grinding or a, some kind of grinding area nearby. But there right, was right. three standalone in the alcove. I call them cookie jars because they were about four feet high. Yeah. And not that wide, right. but really nice. Uh, I mean, it, uh, they were well plastered and everything. But uh, when, when we saw them, and at least two that I can remember were skeletal remains. Huh. How common, and we assume that after they got, you know, after they were finished with them huh. as uh, granaries, they used them as burials. Well, it depends on the group. Um, death is very uh, unique to every culture. Um, and they're, they're, it's, it's almost universal. And there's a lot of anthropological theory as to why it's a universal, but the universal treatment of death with a special treatment is where did they go? Here they had this energy and this energy is vanished. And they're always the concept of energy can either be created or destroyed existed, even if they couldn't articulate it like Newton or like, not Newton, like Einstein's theory. So they couldn't fathom what happened. So what happened in the treatment of the dead varies from culture to culture, place to place. In some places, we don't find it. We don't we assume in that case, and this is always the wrong thing to do. We assume they were cremated. Um, and so we have never found a burial in the, in the granaries in the northern part that I know of yet. And notice I preface it that I know of yet. Because it's it's one of those things uh, we don't talk about like we used to, uh, out of reverence for the <clears throat> people that have passed. But it's really intriguing that they were inside there. But it's not common could, up there. It could be common here. Could it have been animal rather than human? No, they were definitely human. Really, because I'm just thinking yeah. about an animal falling in and then maybe not being able to get out. These were standalone. Oh, okay. Uh, it was in an alcove mm -hmm. up high. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably I don't know two feet, three feet mm. from each other, but they were they were standalone. Yeah, and looked just like cookie jars. Interesting. So, so for those with delicate ears, this is not going to talk about death, but just don't listen for a minute. But I will tell you this: at Cook, it became a primary uh, mount lion den. So they would bring deer back, and they would partially digest it. So we get a lot of partially digested bone. Mm -hmm. So there's bone all over the place. Mm -hmm. And the big problem that you have as an archeologist is the determination of what is human and what is animal. That takes a lot of, 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 of work to, for us to determine. So we have a lot more bone than what I'm sure. These are, these are definitely uh, anthropogenic, meaning the source of their modification was by humans. Um, and we can tell that basically by the cuts. And, and not the gnawing, but it's so intriguing to find digested bone, or partially, it's not digested. If it's digested, we wouldn't find it. But partially digested bone that had been regurgitated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah, it's not what you're asking about, but it's pretty interesting. And a lot of these places become animal dens after they're banded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think these were probably too small and, and the uh, skeletons were pretty much intact. Mm -hmm. So, so what I'm giving you right here is stuff that's burned and stuff that's processed and butchered. We have another site where we have a lot of human fecal material and the human fecal material collaborates what I'm telling you here. We do know that if it's protein, people would eat it. They ate pack rats, they ate bobcats, they ate mice, they ate just about anything that, that was protein. And that's just normal. You know, you're not gonna pass it up. If it's, if it's edible and you know that nobody's ever gotten sick and died from it, you know, you're gonna eat it. But it fascinated me that they ate bobcat and it fascinated me they ate pack rat. So that pack rat that thought it was getting a meal inside that corn, corn crib, <laughs> it might have been somebody's lunch. You never know. <laughs> that is speculation you can't say. Any, any other questions? I think that's it. Well, thank you for your time. Oh, yeah. that's yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. I think um, even though it's not uh, maybe it's the this territory as yeah. far as the history of it but i think it'd be interesting to talk about your the chinese okay. uh, massacre i could do that.